All right, so uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about XLA, which is a new uh, just-in-time compiler that we're going to be releasing for TensorFlow. Uh, we've had a uh, pre-release of the documentation out for about a month or so, maybe a couple months, uh, as we've been trimming dependencies in order to be able to open source the actual code. Um, I'm going to point out that this is work by a pretty large compiler team within Google that has been working on this for quite a while, and some members of the Google Brain team to get it uh, sort of integrated with TensorFlow. Uh, we're pretty excited about it. Um, so there's you know, a sense of the effort. There's a lot of people working on this. Uh, this is mostly members of the XLA team and some members of the Brain team. So a very brief background on TensorFlow. So we built TensorFlow because we wanted a system that <clears throat> had three properties. We wanted to be really flexible, so it's really easy to take different kinds of crazy machine learning ideas and express them and try them out. Uh, we wanted to be scalable so that we can take these ideas and then scale them to large data sets to you know, very um, you know, intense uh, training areas. And then we wanted to be able to take uh, the research ideas that do work out and be able to move them into production contexts relatively easily so that we don't have to sort of rewrite them in a different system that's meant more for production. We want kind of the best of all worlds where you have these three properties. And the first system that we built within our team, which was not open sourced, uh, was good on two of these. It was quite good on sort of scalability and production readiness. It wasn't really that flexible. If you had kind of a fairly traditional training regime for a feed for neural net or a convolutional neural net, it worked fine. But as you get into more exotic kinds of things like reinforcement learning algorithms or very complicated recurrent models, it wasn't necessarily uh, the best approach. Um, and we also looked around at various open source packages and many of those were also kind of good on two of these three attributes and they kind of differed on which two. Um, and so that's why we built TensorFlow. We really sort of learned a lot from our first system and we took inspiration from a lot of the other uh, open source packages for certain features. So the auto automatic differentiation is in TensorFlow is heavily based on what the auto does. Um, we like the production readiness of, of Cafe and so on. So with that, uh, we wanted to establish this common platform. And by open sourcing it, we wanted to have a way of taking machine learning ideas and moving them around the community quickly so that you know, within Google, we could have people build on this common platform and use it for the machine learning research and move you know, ideas from one product team to another or from our research team into product teams easily. And by open sourcing it, we allow that uh, interchange to happen across, outside of Google and around the whole ML community. Um, and so that, that's been uh, good to see. We launched TensorFlow in the open source world about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, 13 months now. Uh, and the initial version was reasonably full featured, so in particular relevant to this workshop is it includes automatic differentiation, so you can take the of your data flow graph and that just gives you more graph. Uh, and it uh, has support for queues, so you can have kind of asynchronous processes that insert or remove things. Uh, in queues, it has uh, some amount of support for the various control flow primitives and a pretty comprehensive set of ops even when we uh, launched so that you can express a lot of different kinds of machine learning ideas. One of the things I think we did pretty well with the initial launch was we put together a bunch of tutorials that showed how to use TensorFlow to uh, express a bunch of different kinds of machine learning ideas. Everything from MNIST, of course, uh, to um, you know, a more complicated convolutional kind of model to uh, a recurrent language model to a full-blown translation sequence-to-sequence sequence sequence model. And I think that really made people see, okay, there's the machine learning ideas, there's how you express them in TensorFlow, and really a lot of people to kind of fairly quickly dive in. Uh, and we had out-of-the-box support for a variety of different kinds of platforms, both different kinds of computational devices, CPUs and GPUs, um, multiple devices in a machine, multiple platforms. Uh, so here's some stats as of a few days ago. We have about 500 contributors, more than 500 contributors to TensorFlow in the GitHub repository. Most of them actually outside of Google, although the contributions uh, by people at Google uh, in terms of the lines of code are larger. 
uh, 11,000 commits, so we've kept up a pretty good pace of improving, you know, the system. Uh, about 30, 40 a day. Uh, one million binary downloads. Uh, we're the number 16 most popular repository on GitHub by stars. I don't know if that's a really great metric, but we're, we're happy with it. We're, we're going to pass Linux in the next few days. It's pretty funny. And then a bunch of machine learning classes at, at uh, different universities are starting to use TensorFlow as kind of the core of that curriculum. And a bunch of companies and organizations are also using it. So, reasonable success so far. Uh, and I think, you know, we've done pretty well on, on trying to have those strengths of a flexible and sort of fairly expressive research platform. Um, and what we're doing now is making that expressibility, coupling it with a just-in-time compiler that allows us to take the expressive way that you express TensorFlow programs and uh, uh, computations and then turn that into fairly optimized machine code. So, with that, TensorFlow graphs go in, and this optimized code comes up. So the rest of the talk is going to be explaining that, both kind of at a high level, how it's viewed from a TensorFlow user perspective, and then we'll dive in a little bit to the uh, like XLA interface level, which most TensorFlow users don't see, but which someone who wanted to say take XLA and target it to a new computational device, like maybe they have some new mobile part they want to do something there. So we'll then dive a bit under the covers uh, in the second half of the talk. Okay, so uh, first thing, if the internet works, we have a brief video. Always excited to do video demonstrations of compilers. Oh, no, wait, there we go. Okay, so this is just a little debugging thing that we have where you can paste in some TensorFlow code, and then we're gonna show the uh, code that comes out. And this little thing here means that I'm going to target this particular uh, nested computation onto a CPU rather than a GPU. We'll show you GPU code in a minute. And basically, we're taking in a input uh, x. We're going to multiply it. We're going to square it, and then uh, that's going to return the result. And so we're going to run this graph where we feed in x as being this uh, four-element vector. And so one of the things that, because we defer compilation until runtime, we actually know the length of the vector is going to be uh, four elements. And uh, what comes out is that code. So essentially, we've taken that pretty high-level Python-based description. Uh, we're now generating CPU code for an x86, because we know that's what we're running on. We also know this particular processor has AVX2 instructions. So you can do four multiplies in a single instruction. And there's your multiply instruction. And that's pretty much all there is. We're pretty happy with that. Uh, and then, if you do the same thing, except now we're going to change XLA CPU to XLA GPU. And the GPU code is a little bit more verbose. But essentially, that is your GPU code. So that's uh, for NVIDIA. Uh, GPU card. So, um, so these programs are going to be built at runtime. The compilation is pretty low overhead. So, for example, if you're familiar with the recent sort of pretty exotic and complicated uh, neural machine translation model work that we've been doing, uh, we have some uh, work like a little stress test of our compiler to compile the bulk of that model, which is like a 16-layer LSTM with attention and pretty complicated thing, and that compilation takes about six seconds. So just to give you a, a measure. Um, one really nice property about uh, deferring compilation to runtime is various variables, like the batch size that we're using, can actually bind very late, and the compiler can actually know uh, the batch size and generate optimized code for knowing that this is a 16 element batch. Um, and so essentially you get to prototype with sort of the normal TensorFlow workflow and because the compiler is fast enough, uh, it just sort of makes the code run faster without you really having an extra compilation step that you notice. So this is kind of how TensorFlow works. There's the TensorFlow gray box at the top, which is the 
the sort of interface that users uh, deal with. Most people are dealing with it in Python, but this works with the various other front ends we have for C++ or Go or um, uh, Java, various other things. Um, and then the core execution engine, which sort of assembles data flow graphs and until this compiler basically interpreted data flow graphs a node at a time, said, oh, it's a matrix multiply op, and here are my two inputs, let me multiply the matrix, and then compute the output, and then put that sort of in, a, in the data structure memory, let me go on to the next part of the graph, which takes the output of that, and maybe does some vector operation. So that interpretation overhead can actually add pretty significant uh, slowdowns, especially if the individual computations are pretty small. So if the matrices are large, it's not a big deal, but if they're really teeny, that can be a big deal. Um, so, and then we have a variety of different kinds of kernels for different devices that are linked into the binary, so you can map these uh, operations, major multiplies, onto the major multiply implementation for CPU and GPUs. Okay, so the way the picture changes when we have XLA is we now have a XLA compiler, and we have these kind of synthetic XLA devices that are one to one with the actual physical devices. Um, and you can do two things. One is you can target graphs explicitly on an XLA device where you say, I definitely want to compile this code. Um, or you can let uh, part of the TensorFlow runtime look at the data flow graph, find pieces that it thinks are a good match for all being compiled together. So it might find like these 22 nodes of some subgraph that are all running on the CPU and say, okay, fine, I'm gonna generate an optimized kernel for that 22 <coughs> node subgraph and just kind of make that happen. Uh, and then obviously things that don't compile, so the compiler doesn't support every TensorFlow operator, it supports kind of the obvious sort of basic linear algebra kind of primitives that make up most of the computation in uh, neural nets and other machine learning applications. It doesn't support you know, JPEG decoding, for example, as an op. So that would still run normally on the CPU with the JPEG decoding kernel, and then the rest of your model might have mostly compilation compiled code. So the hope is that you can think and write kind of that way, but then get the benefits of compilation by compiling code rather than interpreting it, uh, statically knowing a lot of stuff rather than dynamically trying to ascertain the batch size all the time, uh, have um, pure kind of uh, code, and then a bunch of uh, primitives uh, in the system. So, what are we excited about? You know, one of the one of the main reasons for doing this is that we can actually get pretty significant uh, server side speedups, which I'll show you some detailed uh, performance graphs in a minute. Uh, and that comes from mostly being able to fuse operations so that we don't avoid the interpretation overhead, and also know at, uh, at at sort of JIT compile time what the dimensions of various things are. <clears throat> uh, as a really extreme case, so this is not typical, we had a mobile app that had a teeny, teeny, teeny LSTM in it. It's like 10, 10 LSTM nodes ourselves. And that sped up you know, by a factor of 40. Uh, but that's not so difficult. But there, the interpretation overhead, because the LSTM was expressed as like a 22 node subgraph, and it was only like 10 units with a batch size of one, uh, that, that really killed you. Um, the other thing that's kind of exciting is you can use this to reduce the mobile footprint of TensorFlow applications. Uh, and in particular, we have a mode where you can uh, compile things ahead of time rather than um, sort of just in time in, in the uh, runtime system. And basically that turns models into executables, which is uh, potentially useful. So you can then eliminate much of the TensorFlow runtime from your executable because you've just generated sort of a .o file for your model. And we can cross-compile that for ARM and RPC and x86. And as an example, there's an LSTM model for mobile where the code size was roughly a megabyte and dropped to tens of kilobytes. Because you get a .o file and you get a c.h file that you call and your c.h file for your model says please give me the image and what comes out is you know, the softmax classification of it. Uh, the other thing is inside the compiler, 
it provides a pretty nice framework for doing whole program analysis of a variety of different kinds. We've done some of that. We hope the community kind of uh, embraces XLA and adds, adds more. Um, and so we have this nice reusable toolkit of global optimizations to do things like understand what layout would make the code run more efficiently. Should we put the batch in the inner dimension or the outer dimension? Um, understand the cache, so the cache line sizes of the actual thing that we're generating code for and mix and match sort of platform agnostic uh, optimizations and also target specific ones for you know x86 CPUs or power PCs or NVIDIA GPUs or whatever. Uh, caveats, well it's still early, we've been working on this internally for quite a while. Uh, it's reasonably mature but it's going to get more mature over time. Uh, so we're uh, hoping that the TensorFlow community, particularly the developer community, gets excited about this and starts to kind of work with us to improve it. Uh, not every TensorFlow app compiles, so I mentioned JPEG decoding. Uh, other things like dynamic stitch are not necessarily um, things that we want to compile. We really want to focus on the core set of linear algebra kinds of operations that are the bulk of the computation in these models. Uh, we're getting faster and faster. We have kind of a regular dashboard process, which you'll see in the next few slides, that shows us our, um, you know, XLA performance versus no XLA acceleration. We also haven't devoted equal time to all platforms yet, so um, some of the back ends are a bit more mature than others. Uh, and but with the help of the community, we think we could do a lot more. We've already sort of started discussions with some of the major hardware vendors of various types to inform them about this, tell them it's coming, and, and work with them to, to make this uh, worthwhile. Uh, so we're going to be releasing the code in roughly a month. Uh, it, it might be a week, or it might be a month. It won't be two or three weeks, because people are going on vacation. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it's coming pretty soon. Okay, so here are the state of some different kinds of benchmarks. Uh, and this is comparing the GPU backend for uh, an NVIDIA GPU with XLA and without XLA. And so we're going to go from like very simple models up to more complicated ones. And so usually there's going to be two sets of lines. One is inference only and one is a training <coughs> step for that same model where you have the uh, automatic differentiation based larger data flow graph. And so the inference only, you know, XLA gives a 20% speed up for this uh, fairly small, trivial convolutional MNIST model, and a 30% speed up for the training loop. Um, in LSTM, with, you know, order 100 or 200 units, I can't remember exactly, it gives very significant uh, improvements there, 80% speed up and 50% speed up for the training pass. The translation model, we can't quite compile the entire translation model. There's a couple of ops that aren't supported, but we can compile the all the LSTM cells, so the 16 LSTM layers in this model, and for those, uh, XLA gives a 20% speed up, and then we can compile the attention model, part of the model, and for that, it also gives a 20% speed up, and the rest of the computation is actually a very trivial fraction of the computation, so we expect about a 20% speed up overall in this model. Uh, when you're able to compile the whole thing, but you can compile these parts of it, and those give 20% speed ups, which is uh, pretty nice. Um, and Inception, we're getting about 20% speed up on inference, and we're just now faster. Someone implemented an optimization, and we had a little dip at the end there, and now we're faster for the training step as well. So there's a bunch of benefits of this. It specializes the code for your computation. It eliminates the op dispatching overhead, which for models where the amount of computation per op is very small, that's the biggest win you get. Uh, it fuses ops, so we're able to say, take that subgraph of 22 nodes and make one pass over that in order to compute the output of the cumulated effect of all those nodes, rather than taking a tensor, making a pass over it, sending it back to main memory and bring it back in. Uh, it can analyze buffers and reuse memory and do updates in place, if that makes sense. 
uh, can unroll and vectorize and go down to other dimensions. Uh, executable size, can, I already mentioned, can go down uh, pretty significantly. And that's kind of the view from the uh, point of view of a TensorFlow user. You either allow it to find parts of your code it can automatically compile, or you can direct it to say, okay, I want to really compile this part, please guarantee that's going to happen. And in that case, it would, for example, die with an error if it gives, if there's parts of the model that can't be compiled um, and you said it has to be compiled. Okay, so under the hood, um, you can think of an XLA program as a bunch of static decomposed TensorFlow ops, uh, mostly math looking primitive ops. And we want to make these macro ops by composition. Supports most neural nets that we've looked at. You know, we have a whole suite of models that we care about, and those are the ones we're focusing on making sure that XLA's performance is really good, that it can compile, you know, the important parts of those models. So here's, you know, a typical uh, typical example. Uh, looks like that, and you know, those are the most primitive things. Yes, we we get it. Yeah. That's what the compiler is designed to do. Uh, ReLU, so ReLU might be like a higher level definition in your Python uh, <coughs> implementation TensorFlow, but ultimately it, comp it that compiles down to max of zero comma x. And that also <laughs> looks mathy. That's good. Um, softmax. So, you know, one of the things that we've seen is that because TensorFlow's to date has been interpreted, um, Developers internally and sometimes externally have seen the need to take what should logically be just a small set of primitive ops composed together in the right way, uh, and they'll actually implement in C++ a specialized kernel for that particular thing. So if you have like an LSTM cell or a softmax computation, they'll implement a softmax kernel in C++ as a little whole sequence of C++ statements, uh, and they will then get better performance, but it's kind of annoying to have to write that C++ thing. So um, it'd be really nice if we could just compose them out of TensorFlow ops and express them in a much more natural, higher level style without having to do that. And the reason people don't do that today is you don't want to pay that performance penalty of the op interpretation overhead of your 23 element softmax subgraph that would result if you did that. Um, but Basically, you won't have to do that now. So, we're excited about that. Uh, so here's code someone might have written in C++ to implement the, well, actually, implement in C++ to make a faster fused softmax by hand. Um, and so that will no longer be necessary. We're going to generate a fused kernel. Um, and so, basically, one of the real problems is that because you want high performance for a variety of different scenarios, uh, a lot of our kernel definitions actually have statically compiled specializations for, for example, a two-dimensional uh, you know, uh, reduction and a three-dimensional reduction and a four-dimensional reduction. Um, or for custom LSTM cells, you have maybe five or six varieties of those, and you want CPU versions and GPU versions. And um, eliminating that is going to be pretty nice, because that explosion of op fusions that are handwritten is pretty bad. OK. So now let's really go below the, the level of the TensorFlow API and see what happens. So here comes <coughs> the TensorFlow code at us. And there's a computation builder API that is kind of the the highest level interface that XLA exposes to the TensorFlow internal run path system. And when you put sort of a subgraph that you want to compile and you make the right calls in the Computation Builder API, you end up with a high level uh, XLA intermediate representation, um, representation of that computation. And then that allows us to run our high level optimizer which can do a lot of sort of <coughs> high-level analyses of understanding that these are, you know, certain kinds of linear algebra operations, understanding dimensions of the computation, you know, what order things are being done in. And then we can lower that to a lower-level IR after we've done a bunch of optimization. 
And then we might do some target-specific optimizations for CPUs or GPUs, depending on what we're compiling for. And then we generate uh, uh, code, um, typically into an in-memory buffer. And then we now have an executor API, which allows us to exe execute the code that um, we want. And there's a code cache here. So one of the keys in the cache is, for example, dimensions of the input variables, so that if we switch from a batch size of 32 to a batch size of 17, then we'll know that we shouldn't use the 32 batch size uh, code. Uh, so that's a really fast hash table lookup. And then you uh, switch to executing the code that you hopefully find in the cache. If you don't find in the cache, then we go to the computation builder API and actually generate the code. And then there's a stream executor which kind of manages uh, calls from that uh, compiled code to execute different uh, um, calls that that code wants to make. So one of the things about the generated code is if we have really high performance libraries on a particular platform, like maybe there's a really fast matrix multiply implementation that's better than what our compiler can generate for a certain size matrix, we can actually emit a call to that directly from the compiled code. So we don't lose the benefits of having that uh, platform uh, specific sort of really up, super optimized libraries available. Uh, we've also designed this to be reusable. And in particular, uh, we want to have pluggable backends, uh, pass toolkit, we want to emit libraries to like the library calls to BLAST or QDMM. You can either use LLVM, which is probably what most people choose to do, or you can build your own little, little optimizer. And here's what a minimal XLA backend looks like. It's sort of an LLVM and a Stream Executor plugin. And often those LLVM pipelines already exist for a lot of devices. So here's this picture, and now how it looks for, say, if you're targeting a CPU, then you would generate in-memory code for an ARM, RPC, or an x86. And Go. If you're on an NVIDIA card, you would use NVPTX and generate uh, code and then use the stream executor specialized for CUDA uh, within memory kernels and library calls. So we can call CUDA in if appropriate. And you know it's possible that we, you could put together an OpenCL backend. Do you think that would be interesting? Um, and do similar things. And so uh, just to show you a bit of the internal guts of the compiler. There's CPU and GPU high-level optimizer pipelines that share a lot of commonality, but here's the CPU compiler. You can add passes that do different types of optimizations. Um, you know, common sub expression elimination, uh, instruction fusion, layout op assignment. And here's the corresponding, and you can mix target independent and target dependent passes in this compilation pipeline as appropriate. And a similar one for the GPU. And these, a lot of these passes are the same. So improving those improves all the back ends, basically. Uh, and you can also specialize for runtime observed device properties, like which exact GPU card are you trying to get your code for. And we also do buffer assignment and screen assignment here. And I'm going to skip over that. And there's future work. We want, you know, even better performance. We might think right now we think about compiling XLA for a particular device, and it's the TensorFlow runtime responsibility to deal with cross-device communication. We may relax that in the future and have XLA take on things that are all on the same machine, even manage some cross-device things. So we can do more optimization there. Um, feedback for optimization, auto tuning. I think auto-tuning is a pretty interesting area. And this release is coming soon. Performance is going to get better. You want to be able to write the code naturally the way you would want to in the high-level TensorFlow sort of primitive ops and let the compiler be able to get in performance by fusing automatically. It has this nice modular infrastructure so you can fairly easily, if you're a compiler developer, mix and match various optimization passes. It does whole program optimizations. We think mixing compilation and library techniques makes sense. And it's easy to target a wide variety of different hardware. The pre-release documentation is there, so that will hold you, hopefully, until we actually manage to get the code 
out into the open source release in roughly a month. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. question is, do we do any speculative jitting, uh, you know, maybe inserting runtime tests to say, is this thing, you know, negative or something like that. Uh, we don't currently do that uh, that I'm aware of. But it could be added pretty easily. We haven't really seen a big need for it, but... In the back there. So can you tell, uh, talk about how much work it is to add a backend for a non-CPU or non-GPU type of machine, like a TPU, whose so abstractions might be different than what you showed in your graph? Yeah, so the, um, let's see here. The, the basic thing you need to do is implement some LLVM pipeline or some other, if you don't want to use LLVM, you can do something entirely different. But Typically, you would use LLVM, and then you would write a stream executor plugin that allows you to launch different kinds of operations uh, if that's appropriate for your particular device. Um, so the graph that you showed, you decompose the convolution to matrix multiply and add. If I don't want to do that, I want to stay as a convolution op. Do I have an option of sort of providing, giving this input to the jet? Because you had lowered it to more primitive ops than a machine might not have. So I was just... Right, so the choice of which, of how to lower these high level ops into lower level ops is, can be target dependent. Okay. So if your your particular device wants to keep it as a, you know, convolution op because your, your device supports that, you should be able to change the pipeline so that it, it um, does something appropriate and leaves things at a high level if that, if that makes more sense. So the question is, can we like take this and then use it in a completely separate software context outside of TensorFlow, I guess. Um, so that's not what we're designing it for, but that's certainly possible. It's going to be insert put into the TensorFlow GitHub repository. So it will have an Apache 2.0 license. Um, you can rum rummage around inside and use our internal APIs. It's not necessarily guaranteed to stay stable. So we don't consider the surface top of XLA something that we necessarily uh, provide API compatibility from version to version because we want the flexibility to be able to evolve that as, it, as we learn more about these things. So it's really designed to be used in context of TensorFlow. Uh, but I agree there may be, like a better way of expressing that would be to have the use come in as a TensorFlow graph and then use it in that form rather than trying to sort of grovel around in the sort of top, top level APIs of the crowd itself. Yeah, right. So you would have a protobuf definition of a, of a graph that you want to compile, and what comes out is uh, compiled code. Can you, can you comment on what Numba is trying to do in the, the connection that you could uh, make between these two software? What, what is trying to do? Numba? Numba? Numba. Yeah. I'm not familiar with Numba. Okay, so a JIT thing for Python. For NumPy. Ah. Uh, yeah, I'm not that familiar with it. I mean, we uh, want to target more than just Python. So, in particular, TensorFlow is fairly cross-language. So we have C++ front ends and uh, you know Go front end for TensorFlow, and so that's probably not a great option for us, which is um, why we need a, a, a compilation framework that is language independent. Um, I suspect, I don't know anything about the number, but I suspect it's probably pretty tied to Python. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is there support for uh, multiple for unknown dimensions from the compiled output? For instance, if I want to do a head of time compilation and then at a head of time binary support different batches? Uh, 
Uh, yes, I believe that can be done. I don't know, that's a demo the XLA team uses, you know, like the, the people act more actively working on the back ends use. I suspect something like that will be available. Yeah. There certainly will be at least logging statements you can enable in the, the 10 more core TensorFlow binary that will dump out like more debugging information than you want to know about the, the, the code that's being generated. Is the data type uh, float still, or can it be done in uh, there's support for a variety of different kinds of numeric types, including integers and, and floats and various other things. the general question is, you know, the performance characteristics may change of models that you've expressed in a certain way, and they may change differently on different devices, and that is certainly true. Um, certainly fusion helps models particularly a lot where the actual computation is relatively small. Uh, so, um, you know, we've already seen pretty big speed ups in sort of very simple in LSTM cells where the person has expressed it in kind of the natural LSTM form with a bunch of equations that has primitive ops and have a 20 node graph if interpreted, that's where we saw like factors of 40 speed up. And those kinds of things are possible. More likely numbers for realistic models with a fair amount of computation are, you know, 20%, 50% speed ups. So Yeah, the question is how much feedback do we give about what you could do to improve the performance of the code? We don't do anything like that. But, um, that sounds cool if we could do it. <laughs> so, so maybe I have a follow up question on that. So yeah. um, you said uh, if it doesn't compile to Excel ops, it will fall back to TensorFlow ops. Uh, will there be like any tool for analysis to know if we don't observe a speed up, is it because it's not supported yet or because we did some uh, mess with the dimensions or something like that? There will at least be uh, uh, information made available about which things were actually part of an XLA compiled uh, kernel as opposed to not uh, compiled by XLA. Uh, I don't know how much feedback we'll be able to give about what you could change about your program in a way that would make it run faster. That seems like a pretty hard problem. But we will certainly tell you, you know, this part of your program compiled and this part didn't. And probably the proportion of time you spent doing those different Well, if I take one last question, then I'm happy to talk during the break. Okay. someone who in the XLA team would be much more familiar with that and they have definitely done a fair amount of looking at other related work. Um, in essence, we really wanted something where we could fairly easily plug in the support of a wide variety of devices. We sort of view a TensorFlow graph and then having lots of different high-level APIs for, as ways of expressing TensorFlow graphs as an interesting approach and then having the TensorFlow graph feed into a compilation system with many different sort of pluggable device backends for GPUs and CPUs or, you know, interesting, uh, you know, funny hardware from Qualcomm or other people that are building new and exotic hardware. Uh, we think that's a, a really good way to have 
tens of programs and then be able to run them on a wide variety of, of platforms. So I suspect the spiral design point was not that. Um, that's certainly one difference. Okay, thank you.